Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's launch of the Appealing Design, a new research study from the Place Alliance. Um, I'm Katja Stille, Chair of the Urban Design Group and Director at Tibbetts and Planning Urban Design. The UDG is very pleased to support this study and today's launch and building on a tradition of working in partnership with the Place Alliance. Many of us will have asked the question whether the planning appeal process gives any weight to design quality. And why is it that poor and mediocre housing development isn't rejected? When seeing poor developments, many of us will have been frustrated and discussed with one another on a way of how we can improve the system, why planning decisions are the way they are, and how we can improve policy and design quality of the approvals. Certainly at the UDG, we spend a lot of time trying to identify the barriers to good design and working with our members and partners to find practical solutions to these, ranging from strategic processes such as policy formulation and site allocation through to the detail and the design of parking spaces. All these aspects are important to deliver high quality developments as it is illustrated in the case study list listed in the appealing design study. Today, Matthews and Valentina's work is giving us some surprising answers, and I dare say some hope. Despite the Guardian's negative headline, I believe this report should be a positive news story and give us some hope that design is up on the agenda. I recommend reading this report in parallel with the other Place Alliance's earlier studies, the National Housing Audit and the Design Deficit Study. Together, these studies paint a quite clear picture of the current situation. For example, the lack of design skills within local authorities or the limited use of design review and design guidance in some areas, all aspects that relate directly to today's subject. Without skills and design confidence, arguing appeals on design grounds is hard. Together with the appealing design study, these this set of studies and research projects sets a clear recommendations linking also to much bigger topics that we have been discussing in the past, like the leveling up agenda. Shortly, we will hear from responses from speakers and none of them need introduction. And I'm very pleased that they could join us today. We will hear from Joanna Averly, Chief Planner at DLAC, Tim Crawshaw, President of the RTPI, Justin Weber, Senior Building Conservation Officer at Leicester City Council, David Morgan, Professional Lead for Planning Appeals at the Planning Inspectorate, and Christine Thorby, recently retired Director of Strategy and Head of Inspector Profession. As I said, I believe today we are all being given a bit of hope. And so now, without further delay, I will hand over to Matthew Camona, who will introduce the study and the outcomes. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you very much, Katia. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I will be presenting the results of, of the study, Appealing Design. Uh, just before that, thanks very much to um, Urban Design Learning, to the RTPI, Civic Voice, uh, and Urban Design Group for your support and endorsement of our work, and of course to UCL as well, and particularly to the Urban Design Group today for hosting this discussion. Now, just over two years ago, um, a housing design audit for England revealed that three quarters of new housing developments were mediocre or poor when assessed against a broad basket of urban design considerations. Given that, um, we might ask why isn't more of this sort of development simply being rejected by the planning system? Answers can be found in a further piece of Place Alliance research, uh, which examined councillors' attitudes to residential design. And their views can be summarised in four quotes. There's no point in turning down on design grounds as an inspector will overturn on appeal. Design is a very weak reason for planning refusal and likely to lead to costs against the council. The pressure is to come up with the numbers, so design is less important than the delivery of the sites. 
officers are reluctant to decline because they are fearful of the stress, time wasting and cost of appeals. So those are typical of the views that we were seeing back in um, 2019 when we did that piece of research. For too long, uh, the balance of risks between giving consent to poor quality to develop development and losing the inevitable planning appeal has more often than not tilted in favour of not fighting the battle and, and instead simply giving consent to poor and mediocre housing schemes. And the result has been that poor and mediocre design has been getting through the planning system, further raising local opposition against new development in a manner that seems self-defeating if the aim is to build more homes. On the 20th of July last year, a revised national planning policy framework uh, was published containing new, very clear and unambiguous words on design. It says, development that is not well designed should be refused. And that wording is in sharp contrast to the 2012 version of the MPPF, which simply required that permission should be refused for development of poor design. And this means that the test is now the achievement of good design and not just the avoidance of bad design. In other words, the dominance of mediocre design as revealed in a housing design audit for England is no longer considered good enough. The new policy also went on to unambiguously extend the definition of what is considered good design to aesthetic concerns in the past, very often seen as uh, subjective uh, elements of planning. But this has been introduced care of a new statement added to the policy calling for the creation of high quality, beautiful and sustainable buildings uh, and places. So has this made a difference? While well, evidence from our new report, Appealing Design, uh, suggests that, uh, in fact, yes, it has. First, what did we do uh, very quickly? Well, in order to examine design-related appeals, all English appeals reported in the weekly Decisions Digest from the Planner magazine were examined, and thanks very much to the, to the, the Planner magazine for that uh, very valuable resource. Now, about 400 appeals are written up annually in, in that particular source, the, the, the Decisions Digest, with links provided to the original planning decisions. And around half of major planning applications in England are actually included in the Decisions Digest, uh, ensuring that we were able to get a, a pretty good representative sample of appeals to look at from, 2000, uh, from, from 2021. Now, from this source, it was possible, in fact, to identify uh, 32 uh, planning applications heard in 2021 where design had been the major grounds for the original refusal by the planning authority. Uh, 12 of these were actually in the, in the first half of the year prior to the policy change on July the, uh, July the 20th. And 20 uh, were, whoops, I've got to press the wrong button there. 20, 20 uh, were, um, uh, following that change on July the 20th. Now, in, in each case, in each of these 32 cases, the, we, we looked at the uh, inspector's decision letter, uh, and that was examined in detail, as well as any separate applications for the award of costs. And we also looked at the planning portals of each local authority to look at the documents uh, and so forth, so that we got a really good idea of the process and the decision-making logic and the conclusions that had been drawn in each case. So analysis of the pre-July appeal decisions, so these are decisions prior to the policy change, really supported the anecdotal evidence and the evidence that we were seeing from councillors in particular, that design quality was sometimes prioritised in decisions made by the planning ins inspectors, inspectorate, but elsewhere it seemed to be considered expendable. So the result was a bit of a lottery that understandably would have made local planning authorities reluctant to reject developments on design grounds. So some decisions that we looked at, some of those 12 were decisions like the ones on the screen here, which uh, the decision came down in favour of supporting 
issues such as local character or the quality of local living conditions. But the majority clearly prioritised housing numbers, despite the poor quality of design that the inspectors themselves were commenting on, such as these on the screen. The quotes, by the way, are, are from planning inspectors themselves. So while prior, prior to July 2021, the picture on design related appeals was not as one sided as the fears of councillors might have suggested, analysis of the 12 appeal cases from the first half of 2021 revealed that implementation of the then policy on design was at best uh, mixed. Analyzing the post July cases, uh, it was immediately apparent that a marked shift in the likelihood of local authorities successfully defending design based appeals had occurred. Uh, and the shift was particularly apparent in the arguments used by inspectors who on the face of it seemed to have been liberated to consider design on equal terms with other factors. In doing so, they regularly referenced the uh, change policy itself uh, the changed MPPF, as well as guidance in both the National Design Guide and the National uh, Model Design Code. Comparing the decisions after July the 20th to those before, the odds in favour of local planning authorities winning cases on design grounds had shifted from uh, just uh, five to seven uh, against uh, prior to the change to 13 to seven in favour in other words, previously there were more losses than wins for local authorities, and now there, there were close to two times more wins than losses. And actually, if we extrapolate to account for the shorter period covered by the research after July the 20th, uh, five months instead of seven before, then the success rate for local planning authorities at design-related pills was, in fact, three times better than before. If we compare this to historical trends, then local authorities were previously succeeding at design appeals in fewer cases than the national average for all appeals in this particular major class of development. Uh, and now they are running significantly ahead of that national average when the focus is specifically on design. So design quality seems no longer to be set aside as a sort of sacrificial lamb for other factors, whether that's housing numbers or viability concerns. Uh, indeed, 100% of the post-July 20th design-related appeals that we looked at during the research were decided on their design merits, uh, with quality considered at least on equal terms with uh, quantity. And critically, I think this really supports the vital, important, important uh, regulating, regulatory role of planning, which when working well, prevents uh, untold damage to our country's cities, towns, and villages. And, and of course, this is a bit of an unsung um, and often invisible function of planning because what's get reject, what, what gets rejected doesn't generally get built but I think it's a, it's a function that certainly deserves greater celebration. Less positively, perhaps, it was no surprise and, and perhaps no coincidence that of the 32 design-related appeals examined, 26 were in London or the Southeast, uh, with just three in the Midlands and three in the North, and in fact, none in the Southwest. Now, we didn't look at all planning we only looked at a sample, about half in this category, half of the appeals due in 2021 in this category. But nevertheless, the numbers of major housing developments nationally, uh, despite being you know, heavily weighted to the southeast, this degree of skew um, in the appeals data seems to re reflect, I think, a particular reluctance to challenge design outside of London and the southeast. And it also reflects findings in a housing design audit for England that I referred to earlier that generally demonstrated poorer design outcomes outside the southeast, um, as well as wider reports that planning in these regions has suffered from particularly deep funding and associated service cuts over uh, the years. So the appeals data demonstrates further regional disparities, I think, with significant levelling up implications. 
Turning to the spectre of costs, of the 32 appeals reviewed, eight were accompanied by an application for costs, but in only two of these were costs actually awarded, in, in both cases because of what inspectors defined as unreasonable process, um, variously because uh, arguments were being uh, inappropriately applied at the wrong time, for example, when decisions had already been made about certain aspects of design, or inappropriately justified without a clear contextual justification, or applied in the absence of a robust planning judgment, uh, so balancing all, all, all the different factors that should inform planning decisions. For decades, local planning forests up and down the country have been reluctant to refuse uh, poor quality design uh, on, uh, you know, uh, poor quality development on design grounds alone. And six perceptions have underpinned this reluctance. Design is too subjective, people have thought. Uh, quantity, not quality, is prioritised by planning. House builders are too formidable to battle. Uh, good design takes too long to achieve. Design, for some, you know, thought it was just an afterthought. And some felt that costs would inevitably be awarded at appeal. Well, based on the analysis, in fact, none of these perceptions are any longer true, and some, quite frankly, never were. The report concludes um, with recommendations for local planning authorities, which you can, you can read in the report itself. But what is clear is that the tide has turned on design quality and it's time for local authorities to stand up against poor and mediocre housing design, rejecting it when they see it based on carefully reasoned objective decision-making underpinned by local contextual analysis and of course, by an assessment of the planning balance. And, by any relevant national and local policy and guidance on design. Properly done, the consequences of standing up to bad design is unlikely to be negative and over time hopefully can help to build a, a local culture where design quality and, and, and not design co compromises the expectation. Surely uh, I would argue that this is the minimum that we should all expect. So if you uh, uh, want to read the full report, then if you go to Place Alliance, you can download the report there. Uh, thanks very much for listening. And I'll hand back to Katya now um, to uh, chair the responses. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I hope you all agree that this is kind of a, a positive news story and actually gives us something to kind of look forward to a kind of stronger basis um, of um, appealing bad design. So Joanna, do you want to start off with the responses? And please, yeah, uh, yeah. everybody put your questions in the chat as well. Sorry, Joanna. <laughs> Great, thanks Katya. And um, uh, I'm Joanna Avery, I'm the Chief Planner in the department. And first of all, a huge word of thanks from, from myself and the department for what is again, a really solid piece of research and one that as Katya, as you said in the introduction, really adds to our understanding of, of how when we make national policy, when we strengthen that at the local level and apply uh, apply good and solid decision making to it, we get to um, really good outcomes. And I suppose just a, a sort of a, a little bit of embellishment and reflections on, on the top of what Matthew's already presented in, in a really cohesive and comprehensive way. Um, and it's this, that the changes in the MP, MP, MPPF last summer were really intentional. Um, uh, you know, the driving government is that planning is to enable good things to happen. And as, as Matthew rightly said, to stop um, bad things from happening. We are here to protect, but also enhance um, our natural and our built environment. Um, and the decisions that we make both in setting national policy, local policy, and then the development management decisions that follow from that all make contributions to the quality of place and therefore the quality of life for, for all of us uh, and for our communities. And I suspect um, listening in today, and thanks everybody for dialing in, we've got 400 plus people, and I suspect we've got a range of people who work in local government, who are councillors, um, perhaps some parish councils as well, some community groups. Um, so people coming from a broad set of backgrounds. And so I just thought I'd give you a little bit of extra um, uh, observation on the basis very much of Matthew's report. So first of all, this point about planning being a positive process, 
um, um, I think this is a, a, not just a useful piece of research, but it just underpins why we as a set of professionals are on this screen and you've got um, you know, the professional body for planners, you've got the planning inspectorate, you've got leading academics um, and so on. We're here because we believe in the power of planning and we believe in the ability for communities with their political representatives with good technical expertise and advice to describe what is important to a community, to put that into policy and then to follow up with decision making. So that responsibility, I think I suspect everybody on this listening in today and you're here because you're passionate about that as well. Um, and I would really encourage you to take that opportunity and to some extent for some of us that responsibility really seriously. Um, there isn't really an option to do nothing. Uh, the status quo, um, uh, i.e. no development anywhere, um, isn't really going to meet our needs or our community's needs and nor is it going to meet the needs of our journey towards net zero or the ability for us to enhance our natural environment um, or meet our economic um, needs as well as our health needs. So in opening what I want to say is planning is a positive process and this report really underpins where we make where we make proactive decisions uh, define what's important to us in local policy and in national policy and follow through with evidence-based decision making we are making a difference um, and I suppose that's encapsulated in Matthew's opening comments about the fact that also we're sort of slightly celebrating the things that didn't happen uh, with this research and that point about planning is also to protect us from the bad things from happening as well as making the good things happen um, and we should be unapologetic about that. Um, I think the point about inconsistency in terms of um, across the country is another really powerful um, uh, conclusion from the work. Um, it's partly to do with data, Matthew, I suspect, and you not having uh, the richness of cases that you could call upon that gave you a full uh, national picture, as you mentioned. But um, every community should be able to demand the same level of quality of the buildings, the spaces uh, and the neighbourhoods. Um, that they um, are, are seeing come about in their local areas. And that should be um, not a matter of market conditions or the strength of developers or development industry and interests, but actually uh, every community should be able to expect the best. Um, the other thing I just thought was, was really interesting um, was on obviously what would make decision makers cautious, and I mean councillors in particular, um, but also uh, those advising them. And it's that this issue of cost uh, Matthew's conclusion um, and the researchers' conclusion, which is only two cases were awarded, um, uh, uh, um, where the costs were awarded against the local authority. In both those cases, um, the advice of the officials, so the planning officers, wasn't taken. I think that's quite a powerful thing to reflect upon, um, and the collaboration, the strength of collaboration between councillors and your um, local expertise, your communities as well, and the expertise that comes from the community, but also having access to um, people who can help you in your decision-making and help you make the judgments about when is the scheme not just good enough, but meeting the standards set out in national policy, but also in local policy. Um, but, you know, collaborate with your officers and use the expertise available to you at the local level. Turning then to another conclusion, which is good design should not take too long. Um, uh, there's a lovely little, very simple diagram that any client should use. And we are clients for places, aren't we? We, we, we um, look after places. And, and it's the sort of balancing between time, cost and quality. It's always worth all of us keeping that in mind, which is you have a triangle. And all the, when you do any project, whether it's a, a single building or you're designing a master plan for a place or you're doing your local plan, what we're trying to do is deliver good decisions in a timely fashion but being really clear um, that quality is written through all of that process uh, really strongly. Um, and um, what the research is reminding us is that if we get strong local policy, which um, through, for example, things like design codes, uh, then actually that should actually streamline decision making and very much through a process of engagement with communities. And that's why um, uh, you'll all know we've funded um, a further 25 pathfinders working with local authorities and a few neighbourhood forums to prepare design codes in the here and now to support, in a sense, what we launched in the, in the uh, National Planning Policy Framework last summer and to make all this, these good outcomes even more certain uh, across the country. Um, I also just um, uh, wanted to touch on this issue about design not being an afterthought. Um, and I think the responsibility doesn't just sit with 
uh, those that sit on the public sector side, but also development industry. Uh, development industry um, are bringing forward proposals, um, their business model, their attitude, their corporate attitude to design and placemaking is really important. Um, and actually, what we want to see is, is outline planning applications, as, as the research is talking about, um, uh, again, looking at the issues that are important from the outset of a project and following that through. Um, one thing people can also turn to is design review panels who can help them in that analysis of what's being offered, very much again um, set against national and local policy. Um, but importantly, this point about having an ability to test outline applications, not just hybrid applications or full, um, um, full applications. Um, and then uh, the other thing I just wanted to sort of go on to say is that um, the, what the research also sort of says is to sort of de-risk this decision making uh, for local government. Um, uh, officers advice in how you evaluate what's being offered through a planning application and then being able to evidence what's been offered or what isn't being offered is really important. Um, and I know everybody will be thinking about their local design code, starting to work on it perhaps. Um, and we, as we go through these pathfinders, will be sharing information um, as much as possible so you can learn from the projects that might be a little bit ahead of you. Um, and very intentionally, we've got pathfinders across the country everything from a county level code right the way to a site code and very different physical conditions, very different, different conditions in terms of characteristics and market as well. But what I would just uh, uh, remind everyone is use the National Model Design Code as a hopefully a very usable resource. Um, and uh, if you want, there's a footnote uh, in the MPPF and I'll just point it out to you. It's footnote 52 and it basically is saying that the National Model Design Code um, and the National Design Code are relevant now. They are material, they're things that you can use in the planning system to help you as you look at planning applications. Um, sometimes in the absence of fully formed local policy, so please do use them. Uh, if anybody listening in hasn't had a chance to look at it, look at part two. There's really great resources in it. I, it's a very odd little page, but I'll just point it out because it's a really good menu uh, which talks to Matthew's point about where's your evidence. How do you do this evaluation? How do you make good decision making? So thank you very much again to uh, uh, the Place Alliance team for a fantastic piece of research and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Handing back to Thank you, Joanna. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, can you please unmute yourself? Thank you very much. Um, Thanks, Tana. You've already kind of picked up actually a lot of the questions that are coming in through the chat. <laughs> so that worked really well. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, sorry, somebody is called iPhone. Can you please mute yourself? Okay. Anyway, so Tim, over to you. Um, please go ahead. With right. You. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, right. I'm Timothy David Crosshair. I'm the president of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Two. I can hear somebody's not muted, but I'm going to carry on regardless. Um, yeah, absolutely welcome this. It's almost like a eureka moment, isn't it? And I think for us in the design community, my first training is architecture. And I'm an urban designer, you know, cut through the middle like a stick of rock, it says urban design. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. One question I would say is, though, in some ways, why is it all so difficult that we're almost become a subset of a system where we can talk about design? And luckily, the right words were in place when we all knew for the last, I don't know how long, the stuff that was being presented was absolutely awful. And, and there's, there's three forces here, isn't there? There is actually the planning system, which can be there to regulate and everything else. But there's two other factors involved in this as well. One of them is who's promoting what. And actually, really, some of this stuff, it's plain to see, isn't it, when you get the right words and you get a picture of, and who's not seen that, the eight foot close board fence with the houses backing onto the street, for example, I've had that justified to me by very, very convincing people that that's all right somehow. And in fact, when you work in the North, they'll even have the cynical conversation where they say, yeah, we could do it a different way, but this is the North, so we haven't got this product for there. You might have seen it somewhere else, but we're not doing that here. And you go, really? And they go, yeah, really, really, in a very, very patronising kind of way. So the other third factor in that, of course, is the market. And it wasn't until Jamie Oliver pointed out that Turkey Twizzlers 
weren't entirely the best thing we should be feeding children for school dinners. Did we get much change in school dinners? Now, I can't stop, effectively, people going out and buying ready meals, but we can make sure they haven't got horse meat in them as well. And it seems to me it's really important that consumers ask for more as well. So if people didn't buy stuff that was absolutely awful, we wouldn't be in this mess anyway. Now, that's just another thing. Now we have got the bit between our teeth, and I think this is really, really important. We need to double down on some of the more subtle things that are at stake. Now, design on that little step ladder that you've seen all the way up there, there's nothing on that step ladder that actually isn't design, and much, nothing much on that step ladder isn't necessarily material consideration either. And broadly speaking, if you think about it at a strategic level, a cul-de-sac with 185 houses on it and all the affordable ones at the bottom and no bus service because it is a cul-de-sac is plain to see not good design, let alone what the buildings look like or let alone which, fate, which way they're facing in some ways. So there are some absolutely basic principles around connectivity, for example, at a strategic level. But at a more detailed level, and I find this really difficult to argue, even though it's all over the place in terms of the MPPF, National Design Guide, what about orientation? What about sun path? What about prevailing wind? What about your landform and everything else? All these things, as we move towards a crisis in terms of cost of living and where's our fuel coming from, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we need to be designing buildings that are inherently efficient. And the thing is, anybody who's studied architecture, and I did energy efficiency, energy efficient architecture a long time ago, all those basic principles are there. So your standard box that we've been building for I don't know how long isn't going to cut the mustard, but somehow that's acceptable. And you can dress it up however you like, and you can say, oh, well, whether I like the architecture or not, but there's something fundamental that's at stake here. It's the same in multifunctional grid infrastructure. You know, this is a much, much deeper debate. If you've got a piece of green space, for example, that isn't multifunctional and it doesn't meet the needs of those who are neurodiverse or living with dementia or whatever, we're not doing it. It's just not a place that's been designed properly. So while we've got the bit between our teeth, we need to double down now and ask for more and more out of what we can get. Because the more we describe it, the more we'll have objective reasons why something's good or not good. And actually, if you look, even then, I see some of the language that's quoted in terms of the inspector's letters, and it's all still a little bit subjective. And you know what? The major things are at stake are not subjective at all. They're actually really, really objective. They're actually plain to see and they're facts. And I actually, and this is controversial, yes, I think urban designers are really, really important, but I also think confident planners are really important as well, because actually a lot of this stuff is just good planning. And I suppose, have I still got a minute just to say that really at the end of the day, I think there's a, there's a, a real need for us to make sure that us as professionals are not getting behind stuff that you wouldn't be proud of and that you wouldn't want to live in yourself. So that to me is the acid that tests gold. You know, would I want to live here? Can I walk to a bakery and buy a croissant and bring it home while it's still warm? If you can't, there's a question to be asked about whether it's in a sustainable location and whether you're gonna live a good life. And we all want that. Thanks a lot. Um, I mean, that, that, that your points absolutely totally gel with like an you know, urban designer, a planner, um, architects, but also kind of, I think really important, your point about the strategic. You know, if we don't get that right, then only then can we start thinking about the architecture, the look of things. That's absolutely essential. And it starts at the site allocation when we make plans and look at how we allocate land, really, and use it. Um, so thanks a lot. So next speaker is Justin. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Katya. And thank you to Matthew and Valentina for producing this latest valuable report from the Place Alliance. Um, I chair the RTPI's Urban Design Network and work at Leicester City Council in East Midlands. And it's from that latter local government perspective that I'll be briefly talking to today. Uh, so relative to the large volume of planning applications coming through local planning authorities, planning appeals are rare. They, but they do have a profound influence far beyond their red line boundaries. Uh, notable cases are a central feature. Even low key cases will be shared more extensively locally than a typical planning application report. 
and the arguments contained within them helped influence best practice for development management. The spectra of appeals also have a profound impact on the operation of the system more generally, including when they don't actually happen. In the past, I've spoken with a number of planning managers, particularly at smaller district councils, who will have schemes they know do not represent high quality design, but where they lack comfort in refusing them. As the report details, there is potential fear that design is not a safe variable to base a refusal on, and the arguments will be steamrolled by narratives around the primacy of housing numbers or the subjective nature of design as an assessment tool. Quite rightly, appeals have a dynamic that penalises LPAs when they refuse schemes for vexatious reasons, and design certainly can be used inappropriately. But the flip side of this is a fear of costs, both real and reputational. as well as opportunity costs. If a smaller authority is faced with a big appeal, there are potential costs relating to external legal advice, potentially a design consultant to bring in, the lost time for core staff working on the case, and discomfort expending resources on ultimately stopping much needed new homes or other facilities. Uh, as the report helpfully breaks down, some of the perceived risk was arguably less tangible than reality, but the shift in numbers on those ratios for decisions on design-related appeals, coupled with the policy sitting behind it, and the new report itself are potentially something of a game changer. If in the past the endpoint was not considered to be robust on holding the line on design quality, then that effectively compromised the entire system. Break that miasma of mediocrity and you achieve systemic benefits. All developers, not just some, are thus obliged to employ a design team from the start of the process, as there's logically too much jeopardy in not doing so. That doesn't just achieve better design in a vacuum, that massively speeds up the entire planning system through having higher quality submissions in the first place that require less time consuming amendments and corrections. One of the biggest beneficiaries of this would actually be developers of whatever scale who already invest in design, as the system is less clogged up with the poor quality material that is helping delay their schemes being processed. More expansively, if you raise the bar, you're helping dilute the NIMBYs of the future. If people can see new development looks like Accordia in Cambridge or Goldsmith Street in Norwich, but as the standard, you've placated a large chunk of the concerns of that fabled silent majority. Along the way, you've improved the mental health of LPA staff, inspired new generations uh, into the industry and helped break that broken chain between a university system that churns out large numbers of very talented designers and those larger scale developments where too often such people appear invisible. There is good policy through the MPPF, mountains of good guidance and best practice, but as the time of K demonstrated, changing attitudes is very difficult when long-standing biases are in play. Perceptions are inevitably influenced by the standard of other development that have been approved and inclinations towards simply repackaging the existing standard rather than changing it can be pervasive. And that perceptual dimension I've alluded to, you can see what happens when it operates in the opposite direction. Take conservation areas. There's no statutory requirement for new development there to be architect designed, but generally it is. Why? Well, because over time, policy and perception have coalesced around an equilibrium where high quality design is the standard. That represents the opportunity here. Finally, going forward, the report does reference the importance of robust evidence and urban design analysis in the formulation of a case for a design-based refusal. There remains a fundamental challenge here. In Leicestershire alone, we have four district councils that have no design specialists in-house, uh, not even a part-time conservation officer. So addressing that is arguably the next silver bullet to resolve. Such roles can quickly pay for themselves through making development management more efficient and through ancillary work, such as bringing in things like lottery funding to an area, as well as helping embed good design across council functions like parks and highways, which prevents situations where a developer has made plans in good faith and then gets told after they've applied that actually that X building on the site is now a non-designated heritage asset and must stay. So this is better for everyone. Uh, there's plenty of work on going that can be built on in terms of squaring that particular circle, such as from Pooja and her team at Public Practice, and that's particularly in terms of diversifying the sector, which is another fundamental uh, gain that we can make. But ultimately, the benefits of levelling up design quality, I think, cannot be underestimated. So thank you. 
Thank you very much, Justin. And thank you for pointing out the kind of day-to-day -day challenges that the local authorities face as well. And certainly something that kind of needs to be thought about um, to kind of, well, get that step change so that Norwich and Cambridge aren't exemplars, they become the norm. I think that's what we want to see, isn't it? Um, so next one up is David, David Morgan. Hi, thanks, Katja, and, uh, and thank you for the invitation for coming along today. Um, one of the advantages, of course, in going late is that uh, a lot of the ground is covered, uh, and I don't need to reiterate some of the very, very um, well-made points that have been made hitherto. Um, so I'll try and uh, keep it as brief as I can to allow time for discussion. Um, and I'd just like to repeat the, the point that's been made that this is a good news story, um, not just in itself. Uh, it, it's, a, it's robust research, as Joanna has said, but it's written with clarity and verve, and it's a breath of fresh air uh, that builds on um, a whole kind of framework of, of, of design related initiatives and Joanna's uh, not alluded to the Office for Place, of course, in its infancy at the moment, but uh, we have great hopes. National Design Guides, National Design um, looking at coding, uh, which is going to make its way forward at, at different levels in the planning process by um, all likelihood. So this is pitched at a time, I think, when there's a good deal of interest uh, and momentum behind the topic of design. Uh, and it is one that rightly, I think Matthew has uh, identified that's a, a significant factor in the appeals case work we do. I think what I, what I would say and what excites me is that it, it also anticipates um, research that, that I want to initiate within the planning inspectorate around design on a more comprehensive analysis of data on casework, not just at this high level, but beginning to drill down to the lower level uh, of casework. And I know one of the questions in the chat is, you know, how do we begin to explore the, you know, the effect of design related issues and policies on the on the more incremental and single single dwellings to get a really clear picture of the, the traction of, uh, of policy both national and and otherwise so there's a really uh, there's a, a real opportunity to build on this uh, uh, and and really begin to understand the, the the topic in more detail I couldn't help but think that uh, in the cases that that, that, that Matthew identified that uh, we didn't know how many of them heaven forbid have been challenged uh, and also we don't know, uh, in the High Court that is, um, and also we don't know um, the, we don't get an idea of the background of the inspectors and their decision making. And I, I say that because we have uh, specialist inspectors who deal with design matters for particular kinds of casework, uh, not, not, not all by any means. But it would be interesting just to build in a, a further layer, if you like, of understanding around you know, the, the, those decisions and their genesis and for us to learn lessons about it. Uh, and I'll say a, a why, because it's a good news story for us. And I mean, I'm uh, flattered uh, to say, you know, that when you read something uh, like um, the inspectors are very comfortable constructing reasoned and objective design arguments, it's a testament to the way that we do train uh, inspectors to uh, address these issues. And I have to hold my hand up and say, and Christine uh, probably deserves the more credit for it in developing design training within the inspectorate on a, on a continuous learning basis is something we still do. I'm organizing one of two annual training events, which I hope to get Joanna uh, to come and speak to inspectors around. So it's an affirmation that we are getting something right uh, in this area. And it's, uh, it's a very welcome uh, recognition for the work that um, inspectors do. So thank you uh, very much for that. So. I, I think I would repeat without repeating again what Joanna has said, you know, it is actually a, a good shout out for effective policy that we're in a plan led and a policy led planning environment. And when you have effective policy, as this is indicating on the basis of the evidence uh, that the MPPF has got this right, it's also an invitation at a, at a local level for local authorities considering the preparation of design related policies and coding of course with the give them the confidence the knowledge that if this is robustly worded and presented and adopted it will be applied and they can apply it themselves but an inspector 
whose job it is, is to test development against the development plan, amongst other things, including national policy, you know, that they will get the results that they want and anticipate. So that, that, that's, a, that's a, a, um, I think, something that we can be, um, uh, feel very good about. Um, it, it's also the, these outcomes, it's from an inspector's perspective, that, that a, uh, an inspector's decision, an appeal decision is about a balance. It's a balance about, uh, in many respects, harms against benefits. To try and put it simply, and uh, and the the, plan, the NPPF is a is a, a fulcrum for that. And so the, the the determining outcomes of appeals are dependent on the relative weight that you give to particular matters and issues, and the more weight that you give to a particular outcome, um, be it design, the greater that that shifts the balance of the judgment in the inspector's mind. So, uh, and that is the way an inspector works. So with the weight that, that they have and is furnished by policy, both at the national and local level, then, you know, that, that, that balance will shift uh, palpably. It, it's something you can quite easily put in your head. I mean, and, and I think what I would also say, um, that an inspector will deal with the evidence before them. And uh, if, if local authorities are, are confident uh, uh, about articulating why something is bad, or I have to say good, because uh, that, that can be a potential outcome, then the inspector will go to it. And if the evidence is there, they will use it to determine the application they're bound to and use the evidence to test the policy. So it's, I think, a, 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 a renewed call to local authorities to defend those decisions robustly with the expertise uh, you know, that, that, uh, that Justin has uh, alluded to and, um, you know, be confident that they will be heard at, at um, inquiries, but also hearings and when they're presented in written form. So um, thank you. Thank you very much again. And uh, I look forward to more research and more discussions on the subject because it's got to be good. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I think your, your invitation for local authorities to come forward with the appeals will be very welcome. <laughs> um, so last speaker is Christine Thorby. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yes, very interesting report. And I think a lot of positive messages in there about making sure that, you know, you, you, uh, defend um, your case, you refuse it on design grounds if necessary, and you're able to defend it. And uh, as a, I'm formerly from the planning inspectorate, but I'm actually working with Urban Design Learning now to try and build up um, a practical guide to how you deal with designers' appeals. Uh, many of the comments today are about having confidence, about being prepared to say and be able to describe uh, a proposal, its impact, uh, whether it's well designed, all of those things, which are actually seemingly quite difficult. And so the purpose of the um, advice and the note that I'm going to produce is really about how to tackle those things, how to think about design from the outset and how to actually build yourself a robust evidence base from the outset as you go along. And in fact, if you do many of those things, you can, uh, it would help you just as much to avoid an appeal. And in fact, that is really what you want to do because in effect, they take time and resource and they can be costly. And if you can take the right steps uh, and tackle design right from the outset, you can avoid that. But I think there is something about being confident that you um, can, uh, that you have the skills. And there are some things, very straightforward things uh, that you can do. And in fact, um, all of us can think about doing, which, which help. And clearly having up-to-date policies and guidance is really important. Um, I think some of the comments were about that building a culture and expectation of good design. And if you can invest in your policies uh, and your guidance, that gives you the framework. People know what to expect um, and are much more likely to, to come forward, we hope, with uh, really good schemes. I think the other thing is that 
using having the national design guide is absolutely fantastic it gives us consistency of language it gives us consistency of approach it explains components of good design it's got practical solutions and practical advice in there about how to achieve them and i think if we can all use that consistently right from the start it really helps you to be able to um, use language that we can all understand. So if you are uh, in the development industry and you're putting forward a case, your, pl your planning application, you can add cred credibility to your approach by demonstrating that you understand the uh, principles of the National Design Guide and have applied them uh, alongside policy. Um, I think one of the really key things is trying to um, build an evidence base as you go along. What, what you don't want to be doing is retrofitting or, or have to redo. And so some of the uh, advice in the note is about how to do that. So each stage, if you're uh, from the design concepts onwards, if you're building your evidence base to support your planning application, you've already got a lot of information there. And then when it gets to a local authority, if you're building the evidence base to support your decision, uh, then when it gets to appeal, you really are looking to extract the relevant information. Um, and I, you know, inspectors are all human and uh, are just looking to see the evidence. Um, I hope you I hope you heard that. I don't know. I looked down and my mute button's on, but I do hope everybody heard that. But I'll leave it there. Um, yes, the information will be uh, out in due course and I, I hope it will be helpful. Thank you, Christine. We look forward to that information. And I think very important point about the the national consistency. And I mean a lot of developers work across many different local authorities, and I'm always quite surprised and shocked that um, they do excellent almost award-winning schemes in one local authority and something quite poor in another region and then you go like how is that even possible you are the same developer you know same house types so i mean national consistency would be kind of brilliant because then we can all work to a kind of target and we know what it gets hopefully um so we have a few moments for questions. Um, we clearly can't ask all the questions that you've put into the chat. Um, there are so many, and I think we will hopefully in future kind of events and articles and so on that come out be able to answer them. I mean, there's certainly a number of topics which, I mean, the UDG with its partners is trying to pick up already. Um, but there are a couple of themes, and I want to give Matthew and the others a chance to come back to them. One is about um, how important what the lack, was the lack of five-year housing supply in that analysis? Um, that was a question that came up quite a lot. Then the training. Um, can we roll out the training, David, that you did for the inspectors to the planning officers? Would that be something that could be quite easily done? Um, what is the role, not just of the officers, but actually the consultants? and the people de developing the plans, and do we need to upskill them as well? There was a question how many architects were involved in those schemes. Um, so it, it's kind of design skills on, on both sides. It's not just in the kind of planning authorities, I think. Um, and then there was another theme, which was particularly about councillors. What, how can we help councillors make kind of the decisions and give them confidence to refuse schemes on design grounds? Um, so these are the kind of broad themes. So Matthew, if you want to go first, and then if any of the other response wants to kind of pick up certain issues, that would be great. Yeah, fantastic uh, set of comments in the chat. And thanks everybody for responding to the report in, in such a positive way. Um, on the five-year land supply, that was really interesting in the research because it, it, there was this really stark division between pre-July the 20th and post-July the 20th. So pre-July the 20th, if there was any deficit in the land supply, then pretty much you were on a hiding to nothing, uh, trying to uh, you know uh, fight an appeal on design. Uh, that 
factor that, you know, weighed very prominently in inspectors' decisions. You know, even though there's sort of just you know, 4.9 uh, years of supply, that wasn't enough. And, 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 and things were sort of tipping over in favour of granting the appeal. Um, but after July the 20th, um, the, some of the schemes had a, a, you know, more than a five-year land supply, some had just a five-year land supply, some had less than a five-year land supply, but was still being supported on design grounds. And the lesson I took from that was not that the five year land supply wasn't important, of course it was, but the policy was very specific that design was also an important factor. And so that developers needed to meet the design, the new design um, threshold, if you like, before the schemes were going to be uh, allowed. So, and interestingly, the, the authorities, some of the authorities, uh, such, a, such as Leicester, for example, such as Justin, they, they were very, uh, there was a pill in, in Leicester there and, and, and others, they were very open about the land supply situation. Um, they said, right, we haven't got quite enough. Uh, we haven't got the five year land supply, but nevertheless, we feel that design factors are really important in this case. Uh, and the inspector listened to that uh, and came down on the side of those authorities who uh, we're, we're, we're making that case. Uh, on the councillors issue, um, it was interesting, jo jo Joanna re referred to the two cases that were, um, that actually had costs awarded against them. Uh, in those cases, yes, councillors had gone against their planning committee, uh, against their, their, their planning officer's advice. I think they need to be very careful when they do that. Um, it wasn't so much that inspectors always came down uh, against uh, councillors who were going against their officer's advice. In fact, there was three other cases when, where councillors had gone against the officers and yet the, the, the planning appeal had still been uh, thrown out. Um, it's just that I think when, when these things happen at the very last minute in the committee meeting and the councillors say, well, well we, want to, we want to reject this for this, this and this reason, very often those are reasons which may not necessarily be supported by proper sort of assessment made by the officers, maybe of the local context or something. Um, and decisions are made rapidly. Um, and sometimes you then fall foul of this, this, this question of whether you know, decisions are being made um, you know, in, a, in, in, a, in a proper way, you know, following the proper process and so forth. So I think we need to be careful when making decisions against officer advice, but that's not to suggest that absolutely no, it shouldn't, should never happen. Sometimes, you know, it clearly should, and inspectors came down and supported some of those councils. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that, that, that supply position, I mean, um, got some historians uh, amongst us, you know, the, the advent of the National Planning Policy Framework in 2012, which introduced that presumption as it was defined generically, the presumption in favour of development uh, in the context of a lack of a five-year land supply. It was a very clear shift in uh, in national policy at the time. And I think the kind of reaction was that in, in those circumstances, if you couldn't demonstrate a, a supply, you were kind of lost. And even that the cases being made had, had got that sense of um, uh, apprehension around them. But as the, as the framework has matured, and we're right where we are now with the July the 20th iteration of it, it, it what you see in, a, in, in the, the historiography of appeals on land supply is that the phrase is, you know, that the benefits uh, significantly outweigh the harm or to that effect, you know, the, um, uh, the test. And if there are harms there that really do justify the, the dismissal of the appeal, then it will be dismissed. And poor design is in that uh, area of consideration that quite can legitimately, depending on the circumstances of the case, obviously, um, be a, a situation where that will prevail, notwithstanding the absence of a, of a, of a five-year land supply. And decision making, appeal decision making, does reflect that balance. You know where the where the harms do still outweigh the benefit of delivering on housing. 
So very quickly, um, uh, very interested in the uh, question around training. Um, it's something I would very much like to pursue outside of that, and we will be discussing it in the in the next few months, not just for it, local authorities, but for, for councillors as well, uh, and indeed for uh, small, medium-sized um, developers, if, if such proves to be a market. So very interested in being part of an outward-facing element of the planning inspectorate that can help in that area, if that's something that could be seen as worth pursuing. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, David. And um, to Anna, do you want to come in next? Thanks, Katia. And just, just to add a little bit more, there was a question in the chat about defining design quality and how do you make the judgments and also where is nature in all of this and the environment. Um, and I think that's one of the really um, striking things about the National Model Design Code, because it intentionally talks about, let's, let's say, things that we would traditionally talk about in planning. So, for example, how a site is laid out and the architecture of the home and the relationship of the street and the building but it also again very intentionally there's a whole section on nature there's a whole section on resources and all the principles of active travel and so on and so forth so it is a very comprehensive um, um perspective on good place making um uh, from the scale of architecture the front door and the architecture of a home or a building or a place of work or or a school or anything like that, right the way up to the design of, a, of an entire neighbourhood. And actually, even before that, it, 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 at the bigger scale, it, it, in the part one of the National Model Design Code, it outlines this process of understanding your place, doing your proper characterization, thinking about how the existing conditions of a place um, actually help you formulate your land use strategy. So classic planning stuff. So it is planning at every physical scale from the settlement right the way to the front door. Um, and that's what everybody on this call is all about, is being able to sort of, you know, planning and placemaking and urban design and architecture and engineering. We're, we're all a group of disciplines and we all have our different different um, sort of roles to play. Um, uh, um, but this is about making sure we consider all those issues across those different scales. And then when you're faced with an application, you're really clear on what to ask for, what to look for, and then what to judge something against. So again, just to, uh, have a look at the code if you haven't had a chance to before today. Thanks. Thank you, Joanna. Um, Tim, Justin, Christine, any last words? To just, Justin? Just very quickly on design skills, uh, it's, it's a very good point. Often planners did one module in urban design 20 years ago um, and they weren't really listening that much then. There's a real defined need for ongoing design training, things like materials, science, technology is changing, understanding the evolving design processes at the micro scale, quite apart from the bigger urban design um, kind of picture. We have regional design centers. You've got, you've got Esther on the call, uh, Judy Tanner. You could potentially use that as a framework. We have online learning these days. It's far easier than it's ever used to be. Uh, for me, there's no reason why we can't have a, a system in place where there's some annual or periodic core design training for all planners. You just do it. You just go online and just learn some useful stuff. It's better for the architects and the applicants then when they're dealing with very literate planning officers and it doesn't need to be that difficult so yes there could be more on that thank you tim um just to just to echo some of these comments really that there's, there's a large section this is just good planning you know and it's an understanding of that and extension of it and a confidence in that as well um and i think sometimes uh, we've already had um you know discussion earlier about things like you know housing land supply and stuff like that you know there's so much more to planning than that and actually in the heart of hearts, people got into this because they're making the world a better place. Actually, that's what they wanted to do. And, and, and actually, I think we just need to catalyze that burning passion to uh, get better places. And, and I, think, I think that's in every hands. It's great to have design support, but equally, uh, it's part of the job. It is part of the day job as a planner is design. Thanks, Tim. And Christine? Yes, I think um, having been through the inspector side where you have continuous training and that's all inspectors and uh, I think that's why you can see comments such as the inspectors are comfortable in dealing with design, they were able to address it and you know that's continuous and ongoing and certainly I would suggest for um, local authorities you know to, to help all your planners understand design and 
even if it's just to really, really spend time and be familiar with the content of the National Design Guide, what is in it and how do you apply it? Uh, and you know, just to give you confidence, those things that give you confidence to mean you can tackle them. But yeah, the, throughout the development industry, I, I think it's, it, it is about making sure you, you can um, have, have time to spend looking at the way in which to you know, bring forward a well-designed place. We all live in them, you know, we all know what they are, but, you know, having the tools to be able to describe them and achieve them, um, yeah, just, just takes a bit of time and effort, but I think all the material is actually there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, thank you so much for all your questions. Um, there is actually, Matthew, there's another research um, proposal for you in the chat as well of looking at the impact of those poor developments on the communities and the cost of that and again feeding that into it I mean that's that's a really big piece of work um, to really kind of look at the impact and I think you know if we can analyze that impact particularly in terms of health and well-being on those communities living in poor design and then kind of trying to bring all the different government departments and budgets together, I think then we, we're probably really onto something, but I appreciate that might take a bit of time. Um, but at the moment, I think we are all in the room because we are passionate about creating the better places. We want better places everywhere in the country for our communities. And I think today, Matthew, you have given us a bit of hope. And I think we have some, a very kind of clear direction of where we need to work, you know, training, confidence, um, a lot of areas where we can work on together as a group. Um, so I think, yeah, thank you very much, Matthew, for the report, for your responses, and also the audience and, you know, your interest. I mean, we had over 400 people, so it's clearly a topic that is very, very interesting to everyone. And do watch out also the future events on the UDG and Place Alliance, RTPI, because I think we will be all picking this up and pushing it forward. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Matthew, Jana, Tim, David, Catherine, Thank you. Thank Justin. You. Thank you.